Uh, so welcome to FasterCon day three. Uh, we are Filipino Americans in STEAM, science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. Um, we're inclusive of science as well as art. Uh, very quickly, we just want to acknowledge, you know, the land that we stand on um, that is indigenous. Um, I know indigenous people say it was coming up. Uh, we want to acknowledge that as a colonized people being Filipino American. And we're going to take a brief moment of silence for those who lost um, their loved ones during COVID-19 as a result of the pandemic, uh, anti-Asian violence, and police brutality. And we've had a great conference, gosh, it's jam-packed to the last uh, couple of days. So uh, if you're viewing this on YouTube in post, uh, we talked about Black Lives Matter, anti-Asian violence, uh, Angela Kinto, who was uh, unfortunately killed by police uh, last year and the same method as George Floyd. Uh, yesterday, we featured uh, Filipino American innovators from the creative field at the intersection of technology, media, entertainment, and games. Uh, we also spoke with designers and engineers working in the fields of data science and artificial intelligence um, and designers in brand identity, UX and visual design. Uh, today, we'll have our life science day focused on all the life sciences intersecting with technology. Um, we have an esteemed fireside chat with the founding faculty member at UC Merced, Professor Jennifer Manilai, um, as well as Reverend Ostriaka, who is a developer of the COVID-19 vaccine for the Philippines, uh, who is also professor at Providence College in Rhode Island. And we have a COVID-19 panel featuring uh, Lizelle Tanglao of the Filipino Young Leaders Program, um, who is the COVID-19 uh, Task Force Co-Chair, as well as our media advisor, um, and also Charity Nicholas who is our FASTER National Board Secretary and is a health tech and safety expert who's setting the protocols for uh, helping reopen tech companies uh, during COVID-19. And just really briefly for anyone that is a professional um, within FASTER um, that is a part of a tech company employee resource group, we encourage you to join uh, two coalitions, our professional development component, FASTER Pros, and ALA, the Asian Leaders Alliance, um, which is a coalition of over 250 API or Asian Pacific Islander tech and corporate employee resource groups. Um, myself and Charity serve on that board, um, their leadership team, really making sure Filipino Americans are represented um, at the executive level there, as well as uh, our employees. And that's us at Netflix. And lastly, a few things, um, as much as we've also started faster in the beginning with focus on education, uh, we also wanna promote um, more entrepreneurs, uh, high-tech startup entrepreneurs and investors in this space. Uh, they are often too far and few in between, but we do have many leading folks, so we encourage you to join there. Um, there's various links that uh, we have on our Facebook Live as well as YouTube that you can view and post. Um, we're all over social media and uh, you can view us at our website and uh, subscribe to our email list. Um, my last few notes are that, again, this is Filipino American History Month, not Heritage Month. Um, here are notes by uh, Professor uh, Don Mabalan, uh, the late Don Mabalan, who was a historian at San Francisco State University, and her best friend, Professor Allison Tintiang Cobalis, who's also uh, faculty, um, the first tenured Pinay faculty at Asian American Studies in SF State, uh, posting about the differences. And, you know, in founding FASTER, I was very intentional about having this uh, during Filipino American History Month so that we can talk about the historical contributions of Filipino Americans in the STEAM industry. So it's not Heritage, it is History Month. And while we recognize there are many other Heritage Months throughout uh, the year, um, ours specifically is called Filipino American History Month. Uh, really quickly on who I am, I'm Erin. I founded Faster in 2015, along with Charity Nicholas, who's joining us today. Um, we ended up incorporating a nonprofit in 2019. A lot of my family's worked in tech. Um, my parents actually, if you can see in this photo here, uh, my dad and mom had worked in uh, the biotech industry for 20 to 30 years. Uh, my dad works on the COVID-19 vaccine and has been working on FDA approvals for as long as I can remember. And my mom is also a molecular biologist. So, you know, for me, it was very natural, um, even though I had a previous career in civic engagement, that I would end up back in the tech industry. And I'm very privileged 
um, to have grown up in Silicon Valley, being born and raised here, and have a lot of my family in tech is, you know, founders, investors, all the way down to folks that were contributing on the semiconductor line. Um, Filipino Americans have been a part of the tech industry for a long time. Um, I was born in uh, Santa Clara, raised in Fremont. Um, my dad is from Manila, and even though our last name is uh, Kapampangan, he's not, but my mom is Kapampangan, and she's from San Fernando. Um, growing up, I wanted to be many things, uh, like many of Filipinos that love music. You know, I thought I would be maybe an a and just because my, my cousin's best friend is uh, DJ Rocky Rock, who is the Black Eyed Peas DJ uh, for app, an Apple to app, who is um, what we call him Kuya Apps, is a Filipino. So he's also Kapampangan um, and Black. And, you know, at the time I, I'd written an essay saying I would want to grow up to make a lot of money because, you know, Cisco is really cool with innovation, can make a lot of money. But I also really love, you know, music and art. So I thought it'd be two paths. But when I entered Cal from UC Santa Cruz, um, I thought I was going to be actually an immigration and IP lawyer, a professor someday. Um, but the reason why I thought I was going to go into law was because I had uh, a lot of my family that had faced deportation, uh, my brother also had founded companies or tried to found companies, but there was issues with contract and IP law. So I, I had a different path and I actually ended up working for um, Congressman Rokana, uh, who was formerly the former US, U.S. Secretary of Commerce and, and meeting a lot of folks there. You know, there was definitely not as many Filipino Americans who could donate at the presidential level. So I sought to find a lot of Filipino American leaders. Um, and in that process, you know, I was finding my way across different industries. And before I'd said, you know, I thought growing up I would uh, you know, kind of work at Cisco. I ended up teaching at Cisco for my other nonprofit focused on augmented and virtual reality. Currently, I'm working at the intersections of the blockchain and cryptocurrency space uh, with creative to really make sure that, you know, artists, filmmakers, um, anyone in the entertainment industry is actually um, getting paid in a, a different matter. You know, we call this decentralized finance. So that's a lot of the work uh, that I do now. And previously, I had a startup focused on Alzheimer's research and COVID-19. So my path was not linear at all. It was kind of all over the place, um, just finding my way. Uh, through tech. Uh, I've been coding since I was five. So, you know, coming back in, things had changed. There was no, you know, artificial intelligence, um, you know, AI, AR, VR, or blockchain cryptocurrency jobs, none of that existed. And just really quickly, I, m most people know me, if they Google me, they'll find my book. It's on AR, VR. And then this um, winter on my birthday, I'll be releasing my first collection of spoken word poetry for the last 10 years uh, called 16 Dimensions. Um, Portions of the proceeds will go uh, to the Asian American Journalists Association, which myself and Lizelle Tangla are, um, have been members of. Um, and for AAJA, it's in memory of our friend Corky Lee, uh, who is the unofficial uh, photographer of NYC's Chinatown. Uh, and it's also going to Kearney Street Workshop, which is a San Francisco based uh, arts organization. So leaving really quick notes just for, you know, future and aspiring uh, folks in tech, as well as those that are there. Um, two quotes, create your reality. You know, I think anything that I did in tech, it, it came from whatever I imagined the future to be. Um, and that comes from, I think, a place of like self-determination. You know, you don't have to limit yourself to a single company or single vertical. You can do anything. And technology, it's a very creative field. And uh, lastly, behind every uh, pixel is a human being. I think working in the AI industry, particularly AR, VR, you know, a lot of things, as much as I love human-centered design, sometimes ignore, you know, things like ethics and privacy. And, you know, that's part of the reason I, I shifted over to the blockchain cryptocurrency space. But whatever space that you're in, you know, science involves, and this came from our questions yesterday, uh, people feeling really conflicted as Panay's um, a applying to data science uh, jobs and interviewing, you know, with different companies that they may not have aligned values with. And what I said to them was that, you know, I'd taken data ethics courses this last year and they had said, you know, it, well, these courses didn't come, you know, in the last year just because there's, you know, now a lot of focus on privacy and ethics um, with things like uh, data collection, um, for people on social media or whatever that is, um, people actually talked about um, scientists and the H bomb. You know, so this sort of like field when we think about science and technology really goes back uh, decades. Uh, when we think about you know what the responsibility it is to work in STEAM as well, it doesn't um, live in an isolated box. And with that being said, um, we're going to kick off our rest of our day with Filipino Americans in life sciences. I'm going to turn over. Um, 
the rest of this panel to Danny Carino, who's uh, an associate at Natera and also a UC Berkeley alumni. Um, Danny. Hi, um, did you want me to, to share my screen, Erin? Yes. I, can you stop your share, please? <laughs> Thank you. Um. All right. Okay. Um, yeah, hi everyone, I'm Danny Carino. I am a UC Berkeley alumni and I currently work in biotech industry and I work on developing a cancer recurrence and monitoring pro uh, product using genetic testing. And I will be moderating this fireside chat with Professor Manile. Um, we'll go into our slides soon. And I'll also be moderating the chat. If anyone has any questions, feel free to put them in. All right, so Professor Manile, um, if you'd like to introduce yourself and come inside. All right, thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, and thanks to Faster for inviting me to participate in this event. Uh, my name is Jennifer Manili. I am currently a professor at the University of California, Merced. I'm the um, I'm a professor and I'm also the department chair for molecular and cell biology. Um, and here are some of uh, ways that you can uh, contact me. Um, and just for background, I'm the first American born person in my family. Um, my parents are from Quezon City and from Manila. Can you go to the next slide, Danny? Great. Okay, thanks. So um, I was asked to uh, summarize kind of my career trajectory. Um, and so this is a summary of kind of my educational uh, path. Uh, I was born in New York City, and I grew up in New York State, uh, in Rockland County, Spring Valley, uh, New York, and Muncie, New York, um, throughout my first 18 years of my life. Um, and when I went to college, I was accepted at the University of California. And of the three campuses that I was accepted in, I decided to go to Cal. So I'm a Cal alum. And when I started at Cal, I uh, intended on majoring in molecular and cell biology um, with an interest in immunology. So I was really um, intrigued about immunology early on um, at the time when I entered college. Um, AIDS was an emerging disease. Um, we didn't know a lot about that disease, but we knew that it was caused by a virus and we knew that it suppressed the immune system. And um, I think that spurred a lot of my interest. And uh, fortunately at Cal at the time, there, when I entered, there was a major that was focused on microbiology and immunology. And so I entered kind of with that, that goal. Um, at that time, I was also a pre-med student like many other biology students. And so um, was doing all the things that um, pre-med students do, take your classes, and I joined the Filipino-American, um, um, sorry, Filipino Association for Health Careers. I also uh, joined the PAA um, in my later years. Um, so um, I went through my courses, and um, as part of PAC, um, the Health Careers Group, I was paired up with a physician who was an allergist immunologist at UCSF, and he gave me the opportunity to shadow with him during a summer session. And during that summer, um, basically my role was to uh, accompany him in the clinic, and I got to observe um, his interactions with patients. And most of the patients that were coming to him have either um, severe allergies, um, which are controllable through your um, controlling the immune system. A lot of the other patients also had autoimmune diseases. Um, and I, um, I watched him interact and um, um, diagnose treatment for these patients. So this was all very interesting to me. Um, 
this is the first time that I had the opportunity to, to be in a clinic, be in a hospital um, in this kind of setting. And um, I really listened to a lot of the questions that um, Dr. Espiritu was asking all his patients. And what interested me or intrigued me was that a lot of the patients were receiving um, the similar drugs or similar um, um, drugs to treat their disease, almost the same ones. And you know, even though they had very different symptoms and different um, diseases. And so I had asked him, um, you know, what is this drug that you're um, that you're prescribing to all the patients, and how does it work? And um, you know, his response was. Well, you know, it's a new it's a new drug. It seems to be effective across all of these different immune diseases, um, but we don't really know exactly how it works. We know that it stabilizes the um, mast cells in the immune system, but we don't really know how. And um, you know, and that surprised me. It surprised me that um, that um, as a physician, um, that he didn't really understand how it worked, but he could see that it was having a positive effect on his patients. Um, and so I left that summer um, experience realizing that I was really curious about molecular and cellular um, mechanisms of, and how, um, how these drugs could control cells. Um, and that I also realized that maybe being an MD and going the physician route was not the way that I was going to be able to answer those questions. And so I returned to Cal and um, it was the, now this was like my junior year and this is the year where you're, if you're a pre-med, you're starting to take the MCAT courses and really preparing for your applications. And I just didn't feel motivated to do it. I didn't think that um, medical school was the path that I was supposed to take. And I was a little bit lost because that was the only path that I knew. Um, and so I talked with a professor um, in my major, Dr. Good, and she was really wonderful in sitting down with me and um, explaining to me all these different ways that I could um, use my um, MCB degree. And she introduced me to, um, to research programs where I could get a, um, a direct experience in uh, research in the laboratory. And so I was fortunate with her help to get a summer internship the following summer at UC San Diego. And this was my first authentic research experience. I was working with a pediatrician who had a research lab at UCSD. And my uh, role was to help them develop PCR testing for um, enteroviruses from cerebral spinal fluid, which can cause viral meningitis. Um, in that time, there was no rapid test for um, viral meningitis. And so this, um, eff the efforts were basically geared at trying to do that, um, especially for um, diagnosing pediatric patients quicker so they can get an appropriate treatment. And so during that summer internship, I really, um, I realized that I really loved the laboratory bench, I'm good at it, the technical skills, I'm, um, and I, you know, I was really um, motivated, right, about my project, and so I kind of cemented my, uh, my new path that I wanted to pursue um, a PhD and enter a career in research. Um, but returning to Cal my senior year, um, I realized I wasn't quite ready yet to make that commitment to go to the graduate program. Um, PhD programs can be at least five years um, in the life sciences. More often, the average is about six. And so I, you want to make sure that you're really committed and that um, this is what you want to do. And so I decided that I wasn't going to apply to graduate school straight after my bachelor's degree. Instead, I applied to be a staff research associate um, to work in a lab um, and to just uh, kind of work for a while. And I was fortunate to get a job at UCLA School of Medicine um, under Dr. Robert Maudlin, who is a dermatologist and was studying the immunology of leprosy. And so in that lab, I was assisting with experiments on um, from human uh, samples. And our goal was essentially to understand why uh, some patients couldn't 
easily clear the disease and how their immune system does that and how some patients um, cannot and what the differences are. And so uh, working full time as a research associate at UCLA um, allowed me to expand my skill set in the lab and also uh, interact with other scientists who had completed their PhDs um, and to be exposed to a lot of other research questions in the biomedical sciences. And um, I decided, okay, I'm, I'm applying, I'm applying to medical, I'm sorry, to graduate school, and I, but I wanted a medical focus um, in my studies. And I had applied to a lot of graduate programs. My, my, uh, in my mind, in my plan, I wanted to go to UCSD for graduate school. But as I was applying um, and completing all of these applications, I decided to throw a couple of other um, schools into my list that I thought were REACH schools. Um, but you know, why not? Why not try it? And um, and really surprisingly to me, I was accepted to Harvard Medical School's uh, medical sciences program um, in the immunology program. And so, um, so after a lot of um, reflection and kind of deciding, um, you know, I was accepted at UCSD too. And at the time I wasn't sure whether or not I wanted to move back to the East Coast again um, after moving to the West Coast, um, you know, about eight years earlier. But, um, but I decided to go, we, I went to Harvard um, and I completed my PhD in immunology there. Um, at Harvard, I was working in a transplantation immunology lab under Dr. Megan Sykes, um, and Dr. Sykes is now the, um, the head of the transplantation unit at Columbia University. Um, what I didn't realize at the time was Harvard was that the research I was working on could have, uh, would have really long um, um, ranging effects and uh, influence on the way that transplantation um, immunology and organ transplantation and bone marrow transplantation would be improved um, years after I completed my degree. At Harvard, I was my thesis focused on natural killer cells, which are a cell of your immune system that's important for viral infections. Um, and they're also important for, um, for um, preventing rejection of um, bone marrow grafts. And now natural killer cells are currently being used um, for uh, personalized therapies against cancer. Okay, so after, uh, after Harvard or while I was at Harvard, you know, when I entered graduate school, I also decided that I did want to um, pursue a faculty position. Um, I, I was influenced by Dr. Good at Cal who really sat down with me and um, you know, gave me good advice and along the way, I had a lot of teaching experiences where I got to work with undergraduates and train undergraduates in the lab. And so my long-term goal was to complete my PhD and then uh, pursue a faculty position at a university with the goal of, um, of starting my own research laboratory. So after uh, your PhD, if you want to go in academia, you have to do a additional training called postdoctoral training. Um, um, and at that time, we decided that uh, we wanted to return back to California. And so I secured a postdoctoral position back at Cal um, in my home department, molecular and cell biology. And with Dr. Ellen Roby at uh, Cal, I studied um, T lymphocytes and how uh, T cells develop in your immune system and what, um, what are the key features that directs them to develop properly um, in the thymus. And just as a, a side, T cells are the uh, regulators of the immune response. There's different types that can turn on and activate the immune system, and there's others that can turn off the immune system. Um, and the T lymphocytes um, are the cells, incidentally, that are attacked by the HIV virus. Um, so kind of tying back my original interest in, um, in uh, HIV uh, research to later studies. Okay, so I was a postdoc at Cal for uh, five years. And during that time, I did more teaching. I was an instructor at, by, um, sorry, University Extension. Um, and 
while I was doing my research along the way at this time now, I have two children, Christina and Sean, and I'm reaching the end of my, what I'm considering my postdoctoral training and thought, okay, it's really time for me to start looking for faculty positions. And um, during the time that I was a student all the way up to a postdoc, um, the UC University of California was planning for a 10th campus of the UC and, um, and the, the time that I it was time for me to apply, they were looking for a cell and developmental biologist to start at the campus and I applied for that position. And I was fortunate to get the faculty position and I was joined um, one of the, so I joined as one of the founding faculty members of UC Merced in 2005. And I've been there ever since. Okay, next slide, Danny. Okay, so um, my research questions um, are related to how blood stem cells um, are developing into specific cells in the immune system. And um, you may not know, but your, uh, all of your blood cells um, start from a single hematopoietic stem cell or blood stem cell that um, are housed and maintained in our bone marrow um, throughout our lives. And so I've been studying um, how different immune cell types develop from the blood stem cell and what directs them to decide to become, for example, a white blood cell, a B lymphocyte, a T lymphocyte, a red blood cell, or a natural killer cell um, along that path. And I've also um, done some research to understand how these immune cells are activated. In particular, how do they recognize what is self and so don't respond and what is um, foreign, like how do they know the difference between an infected cell um, that needs to be um, attacked and cleared and how do they know not to be activated um, when um, they recognize what is called self. And in uh, recent years, we will, um, sorry, in recent years, we've also started to look at the effect of age on the immune system. Um, and so this is an uh, emerging area of research where a lot of information is starting to be gathered um, with the goal of trying to understand how we might, um, might uh, prevent aging of the immune system or, and what are the components that um, feed into that during aging. And in particular, I've been interested in how bone disease might affect blood stem cell function and immune cell development. The next slide. So in my lab, we use a lot of molecular and cellular techniques. Um, so we use in vitro cell culture, we use PCR, which a lot of you may be familiar with now because this is the technique used for, um, used for um, the rapid testing for COVID-19. We use microscopy, we use uh, flow cytometry, um, which allows us to profile lots of different cells in a sample all at once. And in my, um, research, I use um, laboratory mice as my model organism. And in particular, we study the primary immune tissues and we perform transplantation. So before I move to the next slide, I just want to let uh, the audience know that in the next slide, there's going to, there might be some, uh, there's going to be a picture of some animal dissections. And so if you don't like that, don't look at the next slide. <laughs> Go to the next. Okay, so I just thought, um, I know, I'm the, only, um, I'm the only scientist in my entire family and sometimes in the room um, when I'm with friends. And so when people ask me, what do you do in your job? Like what um, I wanted to explain to them how we do an experiment. And so in my experiments, can you click Danny? And we'll animate. Uh, we use mice. And so when we do a bone marrow transplant, we have to harvest the bones from the mice in the first step. Um, and here's a picture of my student who is doing a sterile dissection in the um, animal facility. Next. Um, here in the cap of the um, lid that's held in blue, there's a, a several uh, bones that from which we will crush and collect the bone marrow. And again, the bone marrow is the tissue that contains the stem cells for your immune system. Next. 
And then we transplant this bone marrow into a new mouse um, that we've prepared for preparation. And so we um, inject the, this animal as anesthetized, as that's what the cone is, and it's uh, asleep, and we give it um, bone, marrow trans bone marrow cells um, intravenously. And we we'll wait at least five weeks or longer to allow the bone marrow transplant to uh, take. And then, um, and then we analyze the immune cell development in that mouse. Next slide, please. Okay, and so um, on the day that we analyze um, the development, we are again um, euthanizing the, the mouse and we are looking in its bone marrow, its spleen, its blood to see how immune cells have developed. And, and then we discuss all these results with each other, we make conclusions, and then as science is an iterative um, process, we end up always having more questions after we get our results. And so this results in um, just um, increasing knowledge gradually and sharing it and disseminating it with um, the scientific community and the public. Next slide. So when we reported our results, um, we publish. Um, and in recent years, I've become more um, interested in how bone disease affects blood stem cell development and function. I've been collaborating with bone developmental biologists and um, I've been focusing on how the immune system is um, altered in diseases like osteoporosis. And in particular, um, in response to um, New, new drugs that have been developed to treat osteoporosis. So many of you may be familiar that osteoporosis is a, a bone thinning disease that occurs as we age. Um, it is um, um, something that um, you can try to control with diet um, and with use and exercise of your bones. But there, there are some um, situations where it this, um, needs to be strengthened with, um, with um, therapies. And there's a new antibody therapy that is available for um, osteoporosis um, that targets a protein called sclerostin. Um, I won't tell you too much information about sclerostin, but basically when you uh, reduce sclerostin protein in your bone, it promotes bone growth. And so it's been shown to be a, um, a very effective uh, treatment for osteoporosis. And it's a, it's a new category of drugs. So it focuses on bone building versus bone um, resorption. And so um, this quote that I have here is from a review article from a couple of years ago that says that the anti-sclerostin therapy may compete to be the gold standard for osteoporosis treatment by 2021, which is now. And the image that I'm showing on the slide, if you look on the right bone, these are basically scans of bones from mice that were treated with uh, PBS, which is just a saline control and the drug on the right. And if you can look closely, you can see that there's um, more bone um, and inside the marrow cavity of the treated mice, which is a response to the drug. So in that category, in that marrow is where your immune cells develop. And I was really curious how this sclerostin antibody affects um, the marrow space in there um, because the studies that I had heard from the clinical trials really focused on just about the bone and not so much about the immune system. But we know that these, these two systems are, um, interact with each other. So um, next slide, please. So in 2012, um, which is when we first published this report, but we started this investigation maybe at least um, four years before that. So since 2008, my group has made several contributions and discoveries related to the role of sclerostin and immune cell development. In particular, we have discovered in mice that B lymphocyte development and also myeloid development or the cells that are involved in inflammation are, in, are, are negatively affected um, in mice that are um, lacking sclerostin or are getting the treatment for sclerostin um, antibodies. And this is important to us, not just because um, um, sclerostin is going to be utilized as a common new drug for the treatment of osteoporosis. So I think it's very important that we also 
start looking at possible side effects on the immune system um, as, as this drug um, moves forward into the clinic. And so these titles here that I'm showing you are just some um, titles from three papers that have come out from my lab, the most recent um, in the International Journal of Molecular Sciences um, just last month. Um, all of these are available through open access. So if you search for Manilai um, J-O, um, you should be able to read these if, um, on your own and access them if you're interested. Um, so uh, next slide. Um, and so when we first published our first paper um, on sclerostin, we didn't realize um, how much of an impact it was going to have on the skeletal biology field. Um, this title here is a report that was basically talking about our findings um, in my lab. And just to, um, just to highlight, like sometimes you have no way to predict the impact of your work. Certainly in 2012, when we published this paper, we were going in just with the curiosity of how does bone health affect immune cell development? And now uh, we have impacted another field that is now starting to pay attention to the side effects uh, or possible side effects of sclerostin therapy. Um, and, um, and so that was kind of a, a serendipitous, serendipitous uh, result and we continue to do this research today. Okay, so um, I want to move to the next slide and just kind of talk about, oh, I missed, I'm missing one, there's one before. Okay, so I just want to tell you some other things that I do in my work as a faculty member. I'm not just a researcher. I'm also expected to teach um, courses and I do enjoy teaching. I teach in the uh, undergraduate biology program. I've taught almost all these classes, introductory biology, cell biology, developmental biology, immunology, and I also teach uh, graduate immunology. And I just have to tell you, I'm so motivated to continue doing my work through my interactions with students. Um, it's really exciting to be able to meet students right when they're beginning their careers and exploring what they want to do and help them reach their potentials. And so these are just some examples of students, undergrads and graduates that I have mentored, advised and taught over the years as they've worked in my lab. I'm also an administrator, so I'm the chair of the department now. So I'm also supporting other faculty um, as they um, develop their research. Um, and I'm also developing, helping develop new um, academic programs at UC Merced, especially geared with um, intentional um, inclusion, diversity and equity. And um, last slide, I didn't uh, mention that I'm also um, got other roles outside of the lab. I'm a mother, a daughter, a sister, a cousin, a spouse, and a friend. And here is a photo of my family. Um, this is a, from left to right is uh, our son, Sean, our eldest, Christina. Uh, my husband, Joel, who I met at Cal a long time ago, we're actually celebrating our 25th wedding anniversary this Tuesday, um, and he's been with me the whole time. Um, and this photo is from uh, Christina's graduation, um, just recent graduation um, from UC San Diego um, this summer. And so, you know, um, you're, you're, there's a lot of people that help to support you and motivate you, and there's other reasons besides your primary, I guess, what you see on your resume and your CV and your bio. And so I just want to reach out um, and let all of you know that we're here. Um, okay, so lastly, okay, so um, Aaron asked us to put in a, a motivational quote, and I'm so fortunate to have been included in this um, set of stories uh, in her purpose by Rose Guado and Jennifer Redondo Marquez last year in 2020. Um, if you would like to re review, I guess, my, my reflection and my story, it's, um, uh, you can get this book. Um, but I think for motivation, you really need to individually reflect on all of your experiences and try to find what your purpose is. Um, it's really the way that you're going to succeed through a lot of hardships and adversity, um, especially in tough careers or in tough situations. And also um, the way that you interact with um, people and um, recognize the, how they can um,
contribute to your team and all of the um, assets that everybody brings to the table um, is important to include. And with that, I'll just end my, um, my remarks and we can move to, I'd be happy to move to questions and answers. Thank you, Professor Manila. You can uh, stop share, Danny. I know you had a, a question when we specifically talked um, last time during our prep call, Danny. Did you want to ask that? Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you for the talk, Professor. Um, well, this was not the question that I prepared, but something that I think is important. I know that when we talked, you also talked about how you did a minor in ethnic studies. Um, so could you go a little bit into how that plays into your like position and role now? Yes, yeah, thanks. Thanks for reminding me. Um, so um, as I mentioned at the beginning, I grew up in New York State. Um, and there was no Asian American history or um, any kind of history that wasn't European history or um, you know revolutionary American history, I feel like in my in my curriculum uh, during high school. And so I didn't even know that Asian Americans had a history in the US until I went to Cal and um, as part of my general education requirements, you're required to take a course courses outside your major. Um, and so I was intrigued. I, in, I took Dr. Chikaki's uh, introduction to Asian American history course. Um, and I was just, um, baffled, you know, that all this history had not been, I hadn't been exposed to it, and that there was a history of um, Filipino Americans in the, you know, in the U.S., um, you know, um, I just thought that all my, you know, all our, my parents and my, you know, and their friends were like the first ones, right, like we're, we're, we're breaking history, and we are making history now, but there was people here before us that, um, that have contributed a lot, and so, you know, that was my first um, kind of exposure to how um, identity and, you know, um, I guess, I don't think it, uh, exclusion or, you know, lack of inclusion um, can affect, you know, how people view others, um, how they view themselves. Um, and I started to become more aware that, you know, in my, in my own field in molecular and cell biology, there were not a lot of Filipino professors. Um, I think I only knew one um, at the time at Cal. Um, and that kind of helped motivate me further to pursue my PhD because I wanted to represent um, Filipinos and Filipino Americans um, and also women as scientists um, as I got my degree. But it's not easy, you know. Um, I think the ethnic studies uh, courses that I took helped give me confidence to express my identity as a Filipino American. But you know, those are safe spaces. When you leave Cal or you leave the ethnic studies program and you go into another situation where you're not really sure how, um, you know, you're kind of um, code switching, right? Trying to figure out how how to be accepted in a new place and whether it's when it's appropriate, I guess, to, to share your, um, all your identities. Um, and so the, the ethnic studies program and my experience with that really opened my perspectives on how I can um, share with others and why it's important to include your entire intersectionality of identities when you're uh, interacting with people. And I think it also helps a lot in um, the sciences because there has been a problem in recruiting, retaining um, minority scientists in STEM. And I think if we work harder um, to um, make it safe and okay to share all of our identities um, and to be visible in that perspective that we can um, increase the number of Filipinos um, and other minorities in the STEM fields. And certainly, um, so it's been almost 30 years since my graduation from Cal and I was really frustrated a couple of years ago because I didn't feel like a lot had changed in my field um, since, since then, but I have more um, colleagues that I meet at scientific meetings that are Filipino or um, part Filipino and we recognize each other at these meetings and we're networking together now. And I see a lot more uh, graduate students and undergraduates 
um, especially at UC Merced, who are um, interested in working in uh, the sciences and are entering these fields and moving on into um, scientist positions in industry as also in academia. And so I think the landscape is changing and we're becoming more visible. And um, it's events like this that are really important to kind of help nurture and sustain um, this, this positive movement. Yeah, and then also going off of that, how um, or how do you think we could encourage and recruit more specifically Filipinx folks into the science side of healthcare rather than you know the traditional and like stereotypical like nurse, doctor, et cetera? Yeah, thanks. So I think just awareness. You know, if I if Dr. Good had not told me about the alternatives that I could um, alternative careers that I could use my degree in, I wouldn't even know that there was, a, you know, there was an, another path. And so now that we have, um, there are more of us in tech fields and working in a lot of different industries, I think that the networking and making, um, making our um, mentees and future, you know, future scientists more aware of all of the different ways that they can contribute to the life sciences besides just the traditional, um, what's considered to be the traditional physician and nurse route. Um, not that those, those careers are bad, it's just not for everybody. And so if you're not um, feeling inclined to go to the physician or nurse route, you're not a failure, you're not disappointing anybody, you just need um, to find where your skills and where your passion lies and you can make very, um, significant contributions. Sometimes it just takes a little more time and reflection on, on your part and some um, talking with some other individuals to kind of find um, that path. But um, there doesn't have to be a linear path. You can kind of like find your way and learn, um, learn through experience. Um, there's no rush either. You have, um, you, you have to really be passionate about your work. And so I think I think more awareness is what's key. Um, and now that I'm reflecting back when I was in the Filipino Association for Health Careers back at Berkeley, when I came back from my research experience at UCSD, I mean, that was my goal that year was to share to all my friends that were seniors in PAC that year that, hey, we can do something else, right? And let's, let's, like, let's promote more, um, more exploration into other careers, not just, not just a few. Thank you so much again for the talk. Um, I think our time is <laughs> closing. Yes. Um, yeah, if anyone has any other questions, hopefully you can still send them in and we can answer them offline. But I will pass it back to Erin now and thanks again. Thank you very much. Naraming Salama, thank you so much, Professor Manilai. Um, for just one, all of your work and, and mentorship of, of students, you know, whether it's through Cal and, and UC Merced. Um, thank you, Danny, for moderating briefly for um, that talk. It's really important that we have more Filipinx Americans in the life sciences, you know, in academia, in research, um, as well as industry. Now I wanted to actually introduce our very good friend of ours, um, Faster um, Media Partner, um, who's been a media pioneer uh, for ABS-CBN. Her bio is so long, I can't <laughs> explain all the accolades that she has in the community. You know, leader at NAFA, uh, the National Association of, was it a Federation of Filipino American Associations, uh, Janelle So. Janelle? Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Professor Manila. That was uh, very, very interesting. I'm not a scientist. Um, but I'm very honored to be included in today's um, rundown. Erin, thank you so much for including me. Thank you for the invitation and congratulations on this uh, wonderful event and also on um, founding FASTER, which is very much needed in our community. I wish uh, we had a lot of this um, 
these organizations um, growing up. Although, uh, just a short introduction about myself. I was born and raised in the Philippines. I actually moved here in my 20s. And in the Philippines, when I moved here, I was already a sportscaster. I was doing uh, sports coverages, international and local events. I was also, um, I also had, um, I was also a newscaster for a primetime newscast in one of the channels in the Philippines. And I had a weekly sports show. So I had a I had what I would say was a thriving career in the Philippines before I moved to the States. And I moved because I chose family over a career. Um, my family moved here, uh, migrated in 2000. First, my uh, siblings were sent to uh, USC by my parents. And then the following year, my parents moved with them as well. And so, um, yeah, I chose to be close to family. You know how we are Filipinos, uh, we love our families, right? Um, and then after that, um, I had the opportunity to uh, start, found, host, and produce the first and only daily talk show for Filipinos in the U.S. For those who are familiar, it was called Kababai in L.A., which started as a 15-minute program, later on um, stretched to a 30-minute program every day. And by the time um, it was around six years old or seven years old, I think um, it was syndicated in Hawaii. So we changed the name to Kababayan today. It aired on LA 18, which is a local station here in Southern California. Um, but then again, um, in 2014, um, I chose family. So I turned my back on my career once again. And I chose family, meaning um, I got married and I chose to take a break uh, because I wanted to raise a family, get pregnant and all that. I did get pregnant um, after I, I gave birth to my firstborn, uh, Liliana. She, in, 28, in 2015, in 2017, I launched um, my own production, which is Janelle So Productions, which produces the weekly show, um, So Janelle, which airs on TFC. ANC and another local channel here in Southern California called KNET 25.5. It is a digital channel um, because everyone's uh, turning digital. We also are available on social media platforms. And um, yeah, at first it was just a job, um, but every day highlighting Filipino stories on Kababai in LA and then Kababai today became an inspiration that there's there are so many of us in different fields and we are making a difference we're not just tooting our own horns that's the problem with Filipinos you know we were raised with this um, value of being timid um, and so I think it's good that we have organizations like this that promote each other and amplify each other's voices and stories. And that's why I'm here today. Our mission here on the show is to provide accurate news and information, tell culturally relevant stories, as well as provide helpful tools. Why do you do what you do? You feel like it's your calling. What's the one thing that you would like for them to remember? Fighter. What made you decide that he's the one and she's the one? So what do you think will it take for you? Make it. My goal as an artist is still to be part of that generation that really brings OPM to the world stage. Hi guys, welcome to So Janelle. I'm your host, Janelle So. And today, this afternoon, we speak to, you know, the, the mind, the heart, the body of So Janelle. And right now, I'm doing a conversation with Janelle Saw. Now, what's to speak with the good and the not so good things that you went through? What do you know for sure? You are at the entrance of heaven. You're at the pearly gates, and God is there. Welcome to heaven. But what was the best thing you did for me? Janelle, can you try writing your epitaph? How would it go? Thank you to all of you for joining us. Thank you for that. And thank you for indulging me with that video. But um, right about now, I want to introduce uh, our COVID-19 keynote speaker, uh, Reverend Father Nicanor Pierre Giorgio Ostriaco, um, who is the confirmed inventor of COVID-19 yeast-based vaccine for the Philippines. Excited to hear from you, uh, Reverend Father Nicanor. Go ahead. 
So thank you. Thank you very much for that kind invitation. Um, can I share my screen, please? I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen. So uh, today, I thought what I would do is just to go over some of the basic facts about the vaccines in the Philippines in 15 minutes, um, and then just to give you a sense of the science that I do. So I am currently, just a little bit of my background. So I was born in the Philippines. I was born actually at the University of Santo Tomas, but my parents left the Philippines when I was four, and I grew up in Bangkok, Thailand. I went to the United States to pursue my education. I did my undergraduate degree at the University of Pennsylvania and did my PhD in biology at MIT. Uh, at MIT, I had, a con uh, had an encounter with the Lord. And so during my postdoctoral fellowship at the University College London, I resigned my position to enter the seminary. I'm currently a Dominican, I'm a friar of the Order of Preachers. I'm a Dominican friar. I'm currently a professor. I have two laboratories, one here at Providence College in the United States, which is the Dominican University in the United States. I'm also a professor at the University of Santo Tomas, which is the Dominican University in the Philippines. So for the past 18 months, I've been involved in COVID-19 pandemic management in the Philippines, primarily as a member of the OCTA research team where I do a lot of the, I'm the biologist on the team, so I, I do a lot of the modeling for hospitals. But uh, today, what I would like to do is just to talk to you about vaccines in the Philippines, as well as uh, the project that my research students and I are doing to develop a COVID-19 yeast oral vaccine for the Filipino people. So I am a yeast molecular biologist. I was trained at MIT to do yeast molecular biology, and so this is why uh, the oral vaccine that we're developing is using a yeast platform. So I wanted to start by showing you an animation of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. This is the best image that we have of the virus that was put together by an international consortium of structural biologists from all over the world. And I just wanted to show you that this is the common enemy. This is the common target for all the vaccines that we're developing throughout the world. So to begin, uh, this was from just a couple of days ago. This is the coronavirus vaccine tracker from the New York Times. And what you can see, I just wanted to highlight that there are over 100, if not 150 different vaccines that are being developed around the world at this time. Uh, we have 18 fully approved uh, somewhere on the planet, 13 that have received emergency authorization, and then several that are in different phases of clinical development. So these are some of the most famous names that I'm sure most of us have heard at this point. So the leading vaccines are Pfizer and Moderna from um, the West. You also have Gamalaya from Russia, AstraZeneca from uh, London, from Oxford. And then you have the Sinopharm and the Sinovax, which are the uh, vaccines that have been developed in China. This is a series of pictures taken from uh, a very seminal event in history. So this is Margaret Keenan. She received the first COVID-19 vaccine outside of clinical trial uh, in December of last year. She lives in the United Kingdom. And what is not often uh, mentioned is that the nurse who vaccinated her is a Filipina who had been serving at the National Health Service of the United Kingdom for several decades. And I use this slide just to highlight, for those of you who may not understand the primary purpose of a vaccine, it's to help your body to develop antibodies. And antibodies, you can imagine, are like cruise missiles. They have, they are, they're targeted just for the, for the virus. And so they're very specialized defense mechanisms in our body to attack SARS-CoV-2. And the target that many of these vaccines are introducing into your body is circled in this image. This is called the spike protein. It's waving in the wind. And this uh, spike protein is the portion of the, the, of the virus that the virus uses at, to enter your cells. So this is kind of like the key that enters your cells. And in fact, the different variants, you might have heard of variants. We're currently battling the Delta variant. Each of these variants have a better key to enter the, the cells of your nose, the, the cells of your respiratory tract, which is the reason why they're so much more infectious. But I, the take home message, however, is that the different vaccines deliver this spike protein uh, to your immune system in different ways. And so these are the four most important 
uh, vaccine delivery system. So the RNA vaccine delivery systems are Moderna's and Pfizer's vaccines. And RNA is genetic information for the, va for the virus. And it, in, the, in many ways, this vaccine mimics the virus because the virus injects its own RNA into our cells. And these vaccines introduce a small portion of that RNA into our bodies. Um, the data suggests that these vaccines last for only three to five days in your body, but that's enough in order to trigger your immune system to develop the soldiers, the, the cells that will be needed to fight off SARS-CoV-2 in the future. The viral vector, this is AstraZeneca and um, Gamalaya. These are the uh, vaccines that are based on a on a safe monkey virus called adenovirus. And what happens here is that the monkey virus is used to deliver the spike proteins information into your body. The whole virus, this is a Sinovac and Sinopharm. Here you take the entire SARS-CoV-2 virus, you, you kill it, you inactivate it, and then you introduce the dead virus into your body to trigger an immune response. And the protein subunits, they're not any right now, actually. So the protein subunit here in the United States is primarily the Novavax vaccine, which is being developed in Maryland. It's been delayed, but it, we hope that it will be uh, authorized for use sometime in this quarter, the fourth quarter of this year. So um, this is just a slide to show you that most of these vaccines are double double shots. But the high point, the, the, the important point here is they require refrigeration. So the Pfizer, Moderna, sometimes they, they, they require what is called ultra cold temperatures. So the Pfizer can require up to minus, down to minus 80 degrees. This is colder than winter in Antarctica. And as you're going to see, these are particular challenges for storing and transporting these vaccines at home in the Philippines. So the safety of the vaccine. So as of this morning, six and a half billion vaccine doses for COVID-19 have been delivered uh, throughout, have been administered throughout the world. Uh, no other vaccine has been given to so many people. And this is so important to emphasize because for in terms of safety, if you have billions of Philippine, billions of people receiving this vaccine, then we can actually identify the rarest of side effects. And that's what you're seeing here. In comparison, the yellow fever vaccine, which has been around for nearly a century, has only been administered to about 600 million people. So again, you just get a sense that so many human beings have been injected with COVID-19 vaccines that we really understand this better than most, better than any of the other vaccines we have available to us. Now, in terms of the COVID-19 vaccines in the Philippines, so um, you may not be aware, especially if you are living here in the United States, that there's a significant vaccine shortfall. So there's just not enough vaccines to go around the world. And uh, one is because there's a shortage of manufacturing. So this was taken from the UNICEF vaccine uh, dashboard. And what you can see is that, um, you know, you've only got eight and a half billion doses of vaccine being manufactured in the second half of this year. And we need so much more of those, especially since um, we have 7 billion people and many of this is two doses. One of the challenges, uh, again, most Americans are not aware is that uh, many of the doses that have been made have actually been reserved by the richest countries of the world. So the European Union has about reserved about seven doses per citizen, and the USA has reserved about 10 doses per citizen. Uh, keep in mind that you only need two doses to be fully vaccinated per citizen. So you can see why, there, again, there's such a shortfall for, for poorer countries like the Philippines, because the richest countries of the world simply have most of the supply. And as of this, as of this past week, the Philippines has 1.4, has reserved basically 1.45 doses per citizen. And remember, you need two doses for fully vaccinated. So we are under supplied at the moment. As of a couple of days ago, the Philippines has received nearly 84, well, nearly 85 million doses. And we have vaccinated about 20% of our total population. But for reasons um, that I cannot go into detail right now, there unlike the United States, the, Phil the national 
government of the Philippines had to undertake geographical prioritization because of the severe shortage of, of vaccines in the Philippines. So uh, we had to focus on the Metro Manila and the surrounding uh, provinces in Region 3 and Region 4. So that is Central Luzon and Calabarzon. These are the provinces around the capital region. The idea here is that all the data over the last 18 months had shown that the, that the variants, the new variants always entered the Philippines through Manila. And so what, what the government tried to do with a limited number of doses was to build a wall around Manila to prevent future uh, variants from entering in the hope that this wall would prevent the variants from entering not only Manila, but the rest of the country. And as of this morning, and so I do a lot of the data analysis. So as of this morning, the Philippines is recovering from the Delta surge, which was uh, tragic and, 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 and really, really um, devastating for the hospital system in the national capital region. Uh, the emergency rooms and our hospitals were overwhelmed in the NCR for about a month. Um, and only now are the cases beginning to finally drop. So as you can see, there are enormous challenges uh, that the COVID-19 vaccination program is simply the largest and most complex public health effort in the history of our country. We're, we're also short of vaccinators. So one of the reasons why in the past month, the number of daily vaccinations have immunizations have decreased is many of our hospital doctors and nurses who were vaccinating had to return to the hospitals to care for our Kababayans who got sick. And so, and then they also got sick. So only now is the, is the immunization program, the vaccination program recovering. But it's so important to see that it will especially benefit the poor and most vulnerable among us. To give you a sense of the challenge we have, we have to vaccinate at least 75 million people, basically every single Filipino adult scattered over the 7,000 islands. And this is before the arrival of the Delta, the Delta variant. These numbers expected to go up. We will have to vaccinate most of them twice within a month because of the nature of the vaccines. And you will have to refrigerate these. We will vaccinate some of our Kababayans in areas with few refrigerators. Um, most people are not aware that only 44% of Filipino families own a refrigerator. So the 66% of Filipino families who don't have a refrigerator really, really struggled during the lockdown. Imagine going through a one or two or three month lockdown without a refrigerator in terms of food supply. That was the challenge that the Arkabavayans faced last year. And today, especially in the countryside, we still have some vaccine hesitancy because our farming communities of Filipinos who live in rural Philippines were not really impacted by the, by the COVID-19 pandemic, so they don't see an urgency for doing this. So my students and I, uh, what we have decided to do is we've decided to develop a yeast delivery system for a COVID-19 vaccine. And this was the challenge. Can we develop a shelf stable? We're thinking two years at room temperature, safe and efficacious vaccine for the Filipino people. And we've called this project Pag-asa and the name of the candidate vaccine is Dominivax. And the platform we are using is this human probiotic yeast. So this is Saccharomyces boulardii. You can actually purchase it already. It has, it has been FDA approved in the United States and in the Philippines. You can purchase the yeast because it's used as an anti-diarrhea medication, especially amongst children, both here in the United States and in the Philippines. And um, what we did is we genetically engineered this yeast so that it would produce a fragment of the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. And so the goal here is that you, and this is just for scientists present, um, this is the, the design of the vaccine, uh, what we are going to deliver. It is a, the, the receptor binding domain of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, and it has been tagged in appropriate ways. It's been modified in appropriate ways so that it will serve, we hope and pray, it will serve as a vaccine when it enter, when, when you drink it. And so this, this is an oral vaccine. And so it will either come in a sachet that you will pour into milk, and then you will just drink the milk and you will vaccinate yourself. So there will be no need for nurses, no need for doctors, no need for uh, injections no syringes, nothing like that. The, the idea here is that it would be an oral vaccine that would be designed so the sachets could be delivered all over our beloved country and people would just drink, you would have to get a prescription because it's a vaccine, then you would add it to 
milk and you would drink it and you would have to drink it several times uh, over the course of, uh, of, a th of a period. We're still figuring out what that would be in order to generate an immune response. And this is the idea that it, you would drink the, the yeast, the yeast would produce this genetically engineered vaccine construct. It would enter your small intestine, your gut, and interact with the um, immune cells that are present in your gut in order to produce the, the necessary antibodies. And so this is just a one data slide. This is just to show you that we were able to develop the yeast that, is, that secretes our um, vaccine uh, construct. And so, um, and I, I'm basically what you do is you grow the yeast and you see whether or not the yeast is making um, what you think it should make. And this dark band, the dark absence of nothing tells you that there was nothing made. Uh, and this, this white here tells you that the yeast that we, that should be making the vaccine is making the vaccine. And this very bright white on the right here is just to know where it is. So this is the vaccine and it shows you that it is in the right place and it should be doing what it should be doing. So we are testing our vaccine candidate in mice at USD at this time. So the experiment began last month. Uh, we will it will we will have our results by the end of October, and we will have to repeat the uh, the trials one more time if they are successful. And we will have to move to one more animal model and then apply for clinical trials for use in the Philippines. So this is kind of where we are. Our hope this our hope and my prayer this is this will be a second generation vaccine because the the the, the idea is that we will have to be. Um, be vaccinated basically every year or every other two years for the rest of our lives to keep COVID-19 under control. And the Western vaccines will be priced uh, quite, uh, quite significantly. So the, the, the post-pandemic pricing for Pfizer and Moderna are, are, I've heard rumors, to $100 to $200 a dose. So this would be incredibly expensive for Filipinos. Our target here is that our vaccine candidate, if it actually works, we would like to price it about one or two dollars per dose to give to give you a sense of the difference between the two. And so, I'd like to thank uh, my students. So, I am an I my my one of my labs is here in the United States, and this is at Providence College. And I had three undergraduates who spent the first six months of this year developing the vaccine with me. I currently have another laboratory at the University of the. Santo Tomas in the Philippines and my, my Filipino collaborators are, are doing all of that work. And we have financial support from a small COVID grant from Providence College, as well as from USD. Thank you very much for your kind attention. God bless you. And I'm willing to answer questions. Thank you so much, uh, Reverend. Uh, I did want to make sure you were connected to Janelle. I'm sorry, my video is off, um, so that she can ask at least one or two questions. I know you have a very busy schedule with all that you're doing. So Janelle? Yes, thank you, Reverend. Um, my question, first of all, is um, election. You know, election in the Philippines, you know, politics is such a big thing. And I have heard uh, things like, you know, they're holding on to the vaccines, hoping to release during campaign time so that um, politicians get more credit for it and all that stuff. So how are the elections, how is the upcoming general election in the Philippines affecting the fight uh, of COVID? So thank you for that. You know, it's so striking you asked me this because I am scheduled to appear in front of the Committee of Good Governments and Public Accountability at the House of Representatives in 12 hours. So in 12 hours, I have to make testimony in front of the Congress because my, my research team and I, uh, the OCTA Research Group is being investigated for our work, our scientific work uh, in the Philippines with regards to pandemic management. Um, uh, I have worked with many uh, public officials, both at the national level and the local government level, and I have been impressed by the sincere effort that many of our Kababayans at home are trying to, to do, given our, our, our severely limited resources in the Philippines. However, having said that, uh, in the past month or so, it's become clear that the politics is, be is shaping the COVID-19 management uh, pandemic management, which, you know, we know, I know of barangays and LGUs, municipalities that are only vaccinating the supporters of the mayor, for example. And, and this is just, you know, we, we, this is just, you can't do that. I mean, they, they, it, um, that's just simply not moral at all. It's not ethical and uh, people will die because of that. And um, 
we've called them out. Uh, but again, you know, it, it's very hard because there's so many LGUs everywhere. So you, you have to control all of them. So, uh, but for the most part, I think that the government is giving, a, a, it's doing its best to, to handle a pandemic. Could it be better? Absolutely. Could it be worse? Absolutely. Uh, there have been so many, there are missteps here and there, but I think overall it is, um, you know, we can only do so much with so little. Um, if anyone here would like to ask a question or two, I think um, I have another question, but I'd like to uh, open the floor first to others. I'm sure you have questions as well or comments. I have one quick one. Uh, when I, I told my, my dad about you, he said, oh, is it uh, in clinical trials? Is it preclinical? I know for me personally, one of the reasons I opted out of computational biology is I told my parents, I was like, I don't want to do bench in a lab for like 10 years to get an FDA, you know, approved drug. Um, it's amazing everything that you're developing, the, the cost, accessibility, um, affordability is amazing. My only question is, is speed. So I know you had the timeline of like, this is the phase that we're in. If we are in almost year two as of next year, when do you hope since, you know, FDA approvals have now been expedited in the U.S., we've had a vaccine in under, you know, like a year's record time. Um, how long do you anticipate or hope for approval so that, you know, we so, can get this vaccine? So my right? target is actually not here in the U.S. My target is in the Philippines. So right. it's an FDA approval in the Philippines, number one. Um, it's it's not meant to be first generation. So it's not meant to deal with the current pandemic. It's meant to be a vaccine that will that will be serve as a booster, as a supplement for the years to come. And, and for the Filipinos who who've told me they don't want to be vaccinated with a needle. So our hope is maybe by the middle of next year, we can, uh, things are so much slower in the Philippines. Um, I'm used to working with American science and you know, even just getting things shipped from here to my laboratory in the Philippines is 10 times more complicated because of the paperwork. So, so our hope is maybe by next summer, we have something uh, in clinical trials, but we'll see. Awesome, thank you. Any other last questions from our other panelists following this? Otherwise, Janelle, you have one last one? Oh, you're Janelle. on mute, Janelle? So with this process that you're undertaking, again, politics, how is it affecting your process? Well, I mean, uh, one of the things that I've tried very hard to do is to have independent funding to shield the science from the politics. Mm -hmm. So uh, that has been successful so far. Uh, the challenge really has been, it's not just the politics, it's just that the Filipino bureaucracy is so much more complicated than I am used to here in the United States. Good, and one last question. How can we help? Is there anything we can do? People here, people watching on Facebook stream, um, that we can do to help you? Well, first of all, you know, I'm a priest, so I have to say pray. Uh, because uh, as, as all the scientists here will know, you can do the best science for years and come to nothing. Um, that's just the nature of science. You're trying to deal with reality. So, so prayer, and I know lots of people back home are praying for this. But also, I think just, um, I, I'm here primarily to encourage Filipino Americans to pursue science. And not just Filipino Americans, Filipinos. You know, I teach at the University of Santo Tomas now. And it's so important. Um, when I teach the, back home in the Philippines, what I discover is that Filipinos, are, they want to go into medicine, but they don't want to go into the science part. And um, one of the challenges that I have, I was trained at MIT, so critical thinking was just such an inherent part of what I do. And for the last year teaching at UST, it's, it's, I am training my Filipino students to critically think and to challenge in a way they're not used to. So I have to give them the language to challenge the data, to challenge me without feeling that I, they are offending me. And so it's, it's a cultural challenge as well uh, to get our Filipinos to do science and to do science well, um, not just to repeat what was done in the past, not, with, not to repeat, uh, not to just do things over and over again, but the creativity, the innovation, the, 
the thinking outside of the box. That's what I hope to encourage Filipinos and Filipino Americans to do, which is why I thank you, Erin, for the kind invitation to, to speak here. I mean, I'm here not really to talk about the science, but but to encourage Filipinos to become scientists. We need the Philippines needs more scientists. I not just Filipino Americans in the States needing scientists, the Philippines itself. Uh, we need to become pandemic resilient. Um, the government is trying to set up a virus, an immunology center, a vaccine center. You can build buildings, but you need Filipinos to, to be trained around the world in the very best science that we can do to return home, to contribute to their country, to contribute to the people by simply being scientists and to do it um, knowing that they're contributing just as much as any other healthcare professional. Uh, you know, doctors and nurses are wonderful, but I tell, I tell my students, doctors and nurses can only do what they do because scientists have done what we do. We provide the tools and the basic knowledge that medicine needs to do what they have to do. Thank you for mentioning that. And you know, the one thing I'll mention, I know Lizelle's on video now. I don't know if she has a question, but uh, just a comment. My parents uh, asked me, I think when I was, I think 22-ish, I was a correspondent for Philippine News and that's how I, I met Lizelle. We were members of AAJA, the Asian American Journalist Association. And I said, well, I'm writing about DJ Cuber and hip hop, mom and dad. And my mom they made me write an article on the Philippine Pathology Center in the Philippines so that they could encourage, they may actually made me print the article after I published it and then mail it to <laughs> Just Dada Bonitao asking for funds, you know, for the Philippine Pathology Center. Because one, I think it's really important that we have independent, you know, scientific research funding. And then two, the, the funding primarily, and this is before, um, COVID-19, obviously, but it was specifically for SARS. So it was at least a couple of years after SARS, but that was over 20 years ago, you know, and I think now that, you know, we've gone through this pandemic, we've seen how important it is that, you know, the sciences in, in public health needs, it was vastly underfunded. Um, we're not prepared, you know, in the United States or, and then the Philippines even more impacted. So that was just my last comment. Um, Lizelle, did you have something to say? Sorry, and one more thing I should point out, right? So um, the Philippines is one of the world's exporters of healthcare professionals. But what that has triggered is we have substantial lack of healthcare professionals. So, so in my analysis today, which I will present to the Philippine Congress in 12 hours, one of the things that's so striking is that in the, in the national capital region, the Department of Health reports about um, two, two, uh, let's say 12,000 available beds uh, for COVID-19, but uh, we can only staff 7,500. So there's a, a 10,000, 10, it's 10,000, but we can only staff 7,500. So, so there's actually 2,000 empty beds, not because there are, there are no patients. We had significant patients lining up outside our emergency room. There were not enough nurses to care for them. And we already had reports of of, of one nurse taking care of six intubated patients where it's supposed to be one-to-one, -one, right? So, so this incredible shortage of nurses um, is so important to point out over and over again. Two things, you know, I'm hearing also, um, I, I, not too long ago, I had an interview with the vice president of the Philippines, Honorable Lenny Robredo, and she was talking about, um, the government's duty to make opportunities available in the Philippines so Filipinos don't have to leave. Of course, when nurses, when Filipino nurses everywhere get double, triple the pay that they can get in the Philippines with, you know, more protection from overseas governments, then um, it's it's a no brainer for them. But sometimes some of them only want to leave for a short period of time just to save up enough money in order to go back to the Philippines. But then when they plan, when they're planning their return, they're also, they're also finding out that there are no opportunities for them. And, and that's, yeah. And, so and that's, you're correct. I mean, what, one of the things is that the Philippine government has to raise the standard of living for our healthcare workers, but you can't raise it too much because then what happens is there's an imbalance in society, right? right. So if you're going to compare healthcare workers and how much they get here in the US, but a haircut in the United States can cost $20, mm -hmm. while a haircut in the Philippines costs, oh, 
two bucks, three bucks. So, so you can only raise it so much before you introduce further inequalities within the country. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that can be done is to encourage a, uh, the Filipino healthcare worker to say, okay, um, can you commit one or two years to serve at home? And then you can go abroad, right? So, so the idea here would be just like we have um, with P the Peace Corps in the United States. Uh, can we encourage our healthcare workers to again to, inc to increase the the wages, but not too much, mm -hmm. but then to encourage them to stay for two years when they're young, and they get trained, and then they can go back out, and then they can they can return in the future. So th there are many. You ha we have to be creative. And speaking of creative, to your point about um, instilling the love for science, I think we should we should create a campaign. Uh, science is sexy, right? Making science yeah. sexy for well, the younger people. <laughs> one of the things my Filipino students say at home is Filipinos, they love music. They love art. They are much more artsy. And the numbers for them is not as attractive. And we have to make numbers sexy, right? We have to do that. And, and it's a cultural shift as well. Also starting in families, um, one last thing too. Um, I was interviewing uh, Dr. Janice Lau. Erin, uh, if you haven't been connected, I'll connect you to her. She's also uh, a STEM advocate. Um, and she was talking about how she was raised. When they were raised uh, in dinner, in, in, uh, over, over dinner as a family, they would talk about how things work. And um, the parents would always find a way to integrate science in every math and science in what they're doing. Like, you know, the, she and her brother, if they had to, um, if they got a pie, for instance, and one wants a slice of the other and all that stuff, they would, the parents would try to explain it in a scientific way without really making them aware that it's science, just making them um, understand that science is everywhere. Exactly. So, um, yes, with that, thank Hopefully you so much. we can much. do that. Thank you so much again for the invitation. Have a good afternoon. Um, thanks, Salama. Thank you for your time, Reverend. Have a good rest of your day. And with that being said, hello, Charity. I am going to briefly screen share and um, I'll have um, Janelle introduce our fine panelists. Give me one second. Janelle. Yes, oh, you're introducing. Am I introducing Charity or Lizelle? Lizelle. Lizelle, right. Okay, good. So I did a little bit of introduction already earlier, but de uh, I, no, um, I have no problems repeating it because uh, I met Lizelle when she was a student, I believe. And even then I knew that she held a lot of promise and she was going to do great for the community. And true to that, Lizelle has been very active, um, a very active pillar of our community while being a bridge journalist um, in several mainstream outlets at the intersection of editorial product, business development, and sales. Um, as I mentioned earlier, she has worked at several media companies, including HuffPost, Associated Press, CNN, CBS News.com, Vice News, now this, ABC News.com, KCBS, KCAL, and Press Enterprise. She is currently the Director of Audience Insights and Innovation for the Points Guy. But also, Lizelle is a very, very active member of PhilPro. PhilPro stands for Filipino Young Leaders Program, which was established in 2012 by former Ambassador of the Republic of the Philippines to the United States of America, Jose L. Quisha Jr. We know it as a network of young Filipino American leaders who are passionate about their heritage and who advocate for initiatives, programs, and causes that advance U.S. and Philippine relations. And so today she's going to be talking about the COVID response of Philpro. I have been hearing about it as well and I'd love to know more. She's currently the Director of Audience Insights and Innovation at the Point Sky, as I mentioned earlier. But Lizelle was a 2019 PhilPro delegate and currently PhilPro Vice President and the Chair of PhilPro's COVID-19 Task Force. She is the Project Director of Tayo, a virtual help desk on COVID-19 for Filipinos. Hi, Lizelle, good to see you again. Hi, Janelle. It's been so long, but like I've also been following your career. So it's great to be on the same Zoom, same space as well. Proud of you, proud of you, and uh, interested to see what you've got uh, for us, especially with Tayo, how you are mobilizing, you know, young Filipinos to really help and be in this, um, be in this space of fighting COVID. Great. Uh, I guess if we could go to the next slide. Um, 
So as Janelle said, um, I am with, uh, I wear many hats <laughs> and I am currently the vice president of PhilPro, Filipino Young Leaders Program, as well as the chair of the COVID-19 task force and project director of TAYO, which is our signature uh, program in response to COVID-19. So um, if we can go to the next slide, the next two slides, I think, um, let's see, Aaron, I don't know if you're still screen sharing. Yes. Um, do you want me to play the video? Yeah, I just played a video. So this is like a sizzle reel. So while she's getting that set up, um, we started um, Tayo almost a year ago. It'll be next next Sunday, actually, is one year since we launched. And it was really a response to trying to figure out what we can do as young professionals, as leaders in our own industries to um, to respond to COVID-19. I think, you know, pretty much it really started out of a Zoom meeting with a lot of alumni of the program. And we started to see a lot of commonalities within our own families. Like when the pandemic started in the spring, like we saw a lot of our Lolas and Lolos, our Titos and Titas just not listening to like the COVID um, guidance of like staying home. So we, we had, we, we were trying to figure out what can we do? And ultimately uh, one of our members had said, oh, I wish we had a playbook to have these difficult conversations with our families. Um, and, you know, connect our community to better resources that are vetted and really culturally tailored to us. So in response, what we ended up doing is creating this uh, Tayo, Tayo, which is, um, you know, Tagalog means us, this virtual help desk to, to do just that. Um, Aaron, were you able to do it? Yes. If not, okay, is it? Yeah, brother. Oh, okay. Do you want to play it? I don't think it's playing. I don't think it's working. Oh, sorry, I, I played it while you were talking. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, I didn't see it. Okay, it's fine. It's fine. Okay, we just keep going. Um, anyways, um, so if you want to go to the next slide then. Yeah, it's, we're there. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so we launched this uh, about a year ago. And essentially, uh, since launching, we... Um, we're able to um, do 500 um, Q and A's, both in Tagalog and in English, um, just on the most frequently asked questions around COVID-19. Um, so since then, if, um, if you wanna go to the next slide, we've been able to reach, uh, we, we launched a pilot in Los Angeles and we've been able to reach um, our key demographics of seniors, um, the unemployed and um, just frontliners. And um, more recently, what we've been doing is, um, if you want to go to the next slide, I don't know if you could play any of these next videos, but um, we just recently wrapped up a, a campaign with uh, the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, they wanted to reach a, the demographic of Gen Z and as well as parents within our community. So we came up with a three video campaign to hit across all that. So one of them, um, the one on the screen right now is a webinar culturally tailored webinar led by um, Dr. Melissa Palma. Um, the other two are a, virtual, um, a viral dance video. We took inspiration from like the Vietnamese hand washing video. And then the last one that um, has been airing on TFC is this PSA, uh, which is a 30 second PSA, just really kind of getting to the core of like why it matters, why you should get vaccinated. Because if you wanna go see your family, you know, that impacts the older folks if you're not vaccinated. So we've been pretty busy since launching a year ago. And um, right now our big initiative that we're hoping to launch later this month is our nationwide vaccine survey. Uh, we got our first major approval finally last month, but we have actually a couple more <laughs> left. So we're hoping we're able to launch that this, this month. Um, and that's really to respond to the lack of disaggregated data on our community. So we figured, well, why wait for someone to do research on us? Like, you know, um, why we can do it ourselves. So this is like, you know, a fully legit survey that is not like SurveyMonkey. It's actually going through an IRB, all that stuff. Um, 
and would love everyone's help once that launches, hopefully later this month. Um, I will let everyone know when that launches. And, you know, for us, it's like looking at mo both short term as well as long term impact in everything we we do. So uh, that that's all on my on my presentation. <laughs> Want me to play the video? I think Charity and I were checking the feed for whatever reason it wasn't showing up. Do you want me to show the second video? I showed the first video for Ohio Health. Do you want me to show? Uh, yeah, the one, the dance video, maybe. The dance video? Okay. Let me go back. Hold on one second. Yeah, I guess the, the sound is not sharing, but. So this was produced by our project manager, this this phase of the um, project, uh, Brian Tahoe, and it features a virtual, um, a multicultural cast uh, on the East Coast. So the approach here, we try to kind of show like another way um, to basically get at vaccination instead of showing a um... So we're going to play this back because apparently the sound is <laughs> loading. Can folks hear? Okay, can folks holler in the chat if they can hear or not? Please, thank you. If you want to show the short 30 second PSA, it's still the slide next, the one, the next one after that. The next one. Okay. Yeah, that's just 30 seconds. I like the first one, but I don't know if the video <laughs> that showed, but we'll repost it. But, um, is it this one, right? Let me just, I don't know why it's freaking out. This one, right? I got that one, yeah. So yeah, so we really were trying to be intentional on like, you know, how do we approach the same, essentially the same messaging, but in different approaches. So um, you can watch the webinar later. It's about an hour, but Thank also you, my name is tailored. Um, and then, you know, just making sure like, we kind of get in the heart of it. I think all Filipinos, it's always looking for the hogot. And I think that, especially that PSA one, I think shows that. And because, um, you know, you can't just, say, hey, just get vaccinated. I mean, you can, but it doesn't, it's not necessarily gonna resonate with our community. So really knowing, you know, who they are and, um, you know, how to, how to get that message across is really important. And that's what we've been trying to do along with like fighting misinformation, so. Yeah. Thank you so much, Lizelle. Um, please rest assured that we're here to help. As I mentioned earlier, I'm gonna say my goodbye now, leave you with the able hands of Erin to do the Q and A, cause I know a lot of people uh, have a few questions for you as well, but just a last reminder and invitation for everyone in the panel and for those who are watching, um, for myself and for my team and for our program, we are always open to amplify stories like this, Lizelle, and some of your efforts. Please uh, don't hesitate to ask if you want us to, um, 
do a segment, do a feature. Uh, we are always open to those suggestions and to those pitches. And you can catch us on social media as well at So Janelle TV. Charity, hello to you. Good to see you. And um, yes, thank you everyone again for having me. Everyone, thank you for inviting me. And yeah, um, I will watch the rest of uh, the event uh, when it's up on YouTube. But for now, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Janelle. Thanks, Lizelle, for that presentation. Um, I, I think the second video will, or the first video will show again for Tayo. Just uh, one or two quick questions that I know Janelle had prepared. She just had to run today. Um, you know, you're the co-chair of the uh, PhilPro, so Filipino Young Leaders Program, COVID-19 Task Force. Uh, as you're working on this project and, you know, even learning from um, Professor Astriaco earlier, today and, and learning that Philippines is, I guess, noted as one of the worst places to be during the pandemic. Uh, in their COVID-19 resilience ranking, Philippines got, I guess, one of the lowest scores. Um, you know, that means your work is so important. I actually had no idea that the Philippine nursing shortage, you know, in, in the Philippines because of export labor is affecting our kababayan there. So what other efforts, um, most importantly, are, are you working towards now and in the future, I know we talked about the survey, but even on other areas like that, uh, in which the Philip Ams or Filipino Americans in the US can help contribute back uh, to the Philippines. Yeah, I think it's important to note that like we, even though we are in the United States, we, we do live in a global society, right? I mean, it seems like, you know, it can be easy to think of like the Philippines, Asia and all those other countries as oceans away. I mean, they literally are, but like the fact is like people move around all the time. And, you know, when you think about travel, like in order for us to get to a point where we're not kind of dealing with all these level of COVID, it's, we gotta get everyone vaccinated. So obviously it's important to help our local community here where we live, but it's just as important to help our Kababayans, not only in the Philippines, but wherever they are. And I know that PhilPro has been working on um, partnering up with other organizations that have been um, working on efforts to get more vaccines there. Um, and it's just, it just illustrates the inequality, right? Cause it's like here in America, we're like basically just doing everything we can just to even get people vaccinated. And we have like the supply here, but you look at our Kababayans back home, it's like, they're, they're trying to get everything they can to get more supplies there. So. Um, that's just one way to think about it. It's not just enough to think about. And I think about the larger us, which when, you know, our, the namesake of our project is Tayo, it's us. But us, yes, as us here, but us as the larger humanity, as well as the, the global diaspora community that we are as Filipinos. I mean, you can find us anywhere. So it only by helping, you know, our combines wherever they are, it also helps us too, because we're never going to stop the spread of this if we don't also think about it in a global scale, as opposed to just here locally. Awesome. Um, Charity, did you have one other question before I know you wanted to present or Professor Minilai? Or any, when I see the audience here and on the chat, I'm always checking between Facebook and here. Sometimes some folks have questions or not. Yeah, I was just gonna mention, I appreciate all that Lizelle is doing. Um, and Lizelle, uh, let us know what we can do to help spread the word about Tayo and um, how we can also start spreading the word to um, the younger generations. So definitely here to help you. We'll definitely let you know once we have at least a survey up, we'll need as many people to Waiting. do it. So whenever yeah. that happens, <laughs> thanks. We'll make sure to plug your videos in our, our next newsletter. Cause uh, I know before when we had talked very early on and you were still in the formation of Tayo, it was like, we're not sure yet. And then when the site came up, I mean, we know folks know about it at least from our, our channels, but I, I think we can do more amplification now that you know, the vaccine is getting more widespread. I know in California, we have one of the lower rates of COVID cases now, which is good, but you know that's still not like just looking at the Philippines, I'm like 20% of the country. I'm like, oh, well, this is not, I don't see myself going back because I know PhilPro is, you know, when you actually go uh, participate in the program, the immersion trip is to go back to the Philippines. And I had been in conversation with um, DOST, the Philippine Department of Science and Tech Technology, DTI, the Department of Trade and Industry. And it's it's hard where it's like, I can't 
go back and advise on like a lot of the tech ecosystem and other uh, emerging tech areas just because you know travel is so much harder and so um, it's really important all the notes that you mentioned and again as Charity mentioned thank you so much for all the work that you do for communities it's really important and we'll make sure to amplify that with faster um, and with that being said we're going to transition to the last portion of our program uh, the woman of the hour uh, Charity Nicholas who is our faster national board secretary uh, Charity I want to let you all know is most people don't know she's one of the highest ranking women of color in the health tech and safety industry um, and is, is a principal EHS consultant at ERM. And so I'd like for her to present um, on her work, which is so important as we think about uh, tech company reopenings, uh, the Delta variant, um, there's a lot of uh, misinformation that's out there. And so, you know, hearing it directly from folks that are coming from our community that are, you know, really setting the standards and protocols for, for the rest of us, um, we want to make sure that we spread accurate information on this. So with that being said, I'm going to screen share real quick, just to, I think, I was, actually, Charity, did you want to screen share and go run through your slides? yourself I want to make sure you get your order <laughs> yeah hold on. let me see let me figure out how to screen share um I have my presentation up uh let me see if I can I need to go back to it there we go can you see that Erin yes and then let me just make sure on this stream and this is also why you know, we edit in post for YouTube. I actually don't do YouTube live just because I know it's a little bit messy sometimes and we, we screen share and have some technical difficulties, but yeah, that should be good. Okay. Can you see the slide? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're good. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Wonderful. Thank you for having me today. Um, I'm excited about this panel because I think it's very important to talk about um, tech and biotech. Uh, the intersection of that and also, you know, how we can work together to spread the word about COVID-19, COVID-19 protections, returning back to work, um, and also continuing to be very active and vigilant about fighting uh, COVID-19 infections. Uh, so this is me. Um, you can reach me at these channels. Um, oops, sorry. Uh, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn. Oops. And some of these didn't change. <laughs> the uh, Instagram is actually ccnic48. So um, we can up that, it, update that later. Uh, a, a little bit about me. Who am I? I'm a principal consultant at a global environmental company called Environmental Resources Management. Um, I am a COVID-19 technical lead. I'm on part of the DEI committee. Um, so really raising awareness and uplifting um, people of color into management positions, as Aaron mentioned. Uh, I am principal consultant, but also I'm also on a path to partner program, and there are very few Filipinos. Actually, last month I met the one other Filipino who is a partner um, and just joined in the Pacific Northwest and in Seattle. So we are the only two that I know about um, out of about 120 partners. I'm also on the technical recruiting team, so if you need a job, please reach out to me. Uh, I'm also an auditing, uh, an auditing lead as well. And I help mentor um, employees into getting into auditing, into environmental health and safety topics. Uh, I'm part of the Cal Filipino American uh, Alumni Chapter. I was president until 2021, January this year, and now I'm on the advisory board and then the advisory board of FASTER and also the American Society of Safety Professionals in San Francisco. I'm the Women um, in Safety Excellence uh, president. I also mentor, so uh, I was part of the Collective Hustle Mentorship Program, Lead Filipino Fly Panais, uh, which has incorporated mentorship from also um, the uh, Cal PAC chapter and also FASTER. I'm a public speaker, trainer, community leader, photographer, mother and wife, um, kind of tailoring uh, and uh, pivoting into what Jennifer Manila said, we're not just career women, but also we're also uh, family, um, you know, members as well. And uh, I think that makes us even more engaged in our community because um, you are all our family. Uh, this is my family, um, my late husband, Eric, and also my four children and our dog, Leila. 
Uh, so I'm going to just give a brief overview of the COVID-19 Delta variant and its impacts, things that have been happening in the world recently. Um, as uh, you know, Reverend talked about uh, COVID-19, he talked about the spikes. The Delta variant is um, one of the spikes actually, and you can see here um, on this left slide, uh, it's close to the one seen in the South African and Brazilian variants. Uh, it is very active. Uh, it has some transmissibility concerns, and we'll go over that in just a bit. Uh, and also what the efficacy is of the different vaccines. So as you can see here, the COVID-19 variant, what happens is in people who are unvaccinated or not vaccinated, um, the COVID-19 uh, variants will continue to mutate and then um, because these individuals are not vaccinated, they will spread those mutated variants out, and that could become uh, more virulent in the community. The Delta variant, as you can see here under the CDC designation, is of concern. Under the World Health Organization is a concern. Um, if you are vaccinated, you're still protected against it, but it is very virulent. Um, as you've heard in the news, um, it's highly transmissible. Um, there, It's highly potent. Uh, it results in increased hospitalizations and deaths, even in those who are vaccinated. So uh, we really need to be careful. And you've heard about the boosters coming out. So there are COVID-19 boosters that are starting to be released in the United States. Uh, I'm not sure about other parts of the world. Um, but those boosters are meant to address other variants that are coming. And I want to let you know that the Delta variant is virulent right now and one of the most active. It is not the only. There are many other variants around which can be the new virulent variant. Um, you can see here, in starting in February, um, moving on to July, I don't have the data for August and September, but you can see that um, there was increase uh, of the Delta variant and the percentage uh, in many different countries all around the world. Okay, you can see here going global, this is as of, I believe, uh, June 28th. Uh, you can see that the Delta variant has quickly spread in different areas of the world, and you can see that that's the dark red. Um, what's been happening, you've been seeing lockdowns, you've been seeing um, a lot of uh, states, uh, countries that are starting to push back on reopening plans. Um, Australia, Britain, a lot of those closed down states, closed down the country. Um, many areas are still accepting uh, travelers, but uh, they are giving warnings. Um, they are requiring, a lot of places are requiring uh, COVID-19 vaccinations or proof of neg negative COVID-19 um, exposure. Okay, for the vaccine efficacy, um, the most uh, effective is the Pfizer vaccine, as you can see here, which is 88% effective, uh, whereas AstraZeneca and Johnson Johnson about 60%. There are other vaccines throughout the world uh, produced by different countries that could have a lower percentage um, or similar percentage, um, but I do not have that data. Uh, but just to let you know, if you do have a vaccine, there are um, high percentages for those to protect you against the Delta variant and other air variants that are um, coming on board. Uh, the next part of the presentation, I'll just share to you um, what I deal with a lot is return to work. So the return to work strategies um, that are continuing from the beginning of COVID-19 are still in place. Uh, I work with a lot of high level tech companies, um, Apple, Google, Salesforce, um, you know, a lot of the biotech companies, Roche, Genentech, um, a, a lot of these are continuing um, their COVID-19 protocols. And you'll see this if you return back to work, um, the first is preparing the building. The second is communicating, preparing the workforce with what to anticipate. 
uh, controlling access to those who really need to be on site, creating a physical distance plan, which means uh, reducing the number of people who are in different areas, maybe isolating people to work in their offices, working six feet apart. We are going to continue that. I'm seeing that throughout the world, reducing touch points, still continuing cleaning, um, and then also uh, communicating that. So. Uh, with confidence uh, from high-level executives to their staff. Uh, so a big part of creating a plan is creating that communication. Um, and I'm going to just give a very high level of four main mitigation measures to bringing people back to work. You'll be seeing this maybe um, maybe you'll see it late fall, early 2022. I've been hearing summer 2022 when a lot of the um, larger tech companies are opening, but you'll see different variations depending on what your work requires and whether you need to be on site. Um, so one is access controls. We talked about um, keeping people um, working from home if they don't really need to be in the office, if they can work remotely. I know with my company, we have opened up some offices, but there is no requirement to return back to work. If we opt to work from home, that is totally allowable. And I'm seeing that throughout all the tech companies. Many of the companies throughout the world um, are still allowing uh, work from home. Uh, High-risk groups especially, uh, when you do come into the office, requiring temperature checks. So you'll see a lot of these either man stations where somebody is uh, putting a um, thermometer to your um, forehead, or you may see the independent stations where you go up to a screen and it, it will uh, read your temperature, look at your face, um, figure out if you fall within the acceptable temperature range wearing face masks is continuing, and also um, office cleaning and hygiene. Um, here are some example photos of uh, you know temperature monitoring. You can see on the left side photo, uh, people are keeping their social distancing um, six feet or more apart while they're waiting in line to uh, get their temperature checked. On the right side, you can see the arrows. Um, Many reception areas are still requiring a one entry point, following the arrows, getting your temperature screen, and then not going back through the line to go out. It's, it's really a one-way path, and you'll see that in a lot of the areas. Um, this is an example of work of a work area redesign where um, you can see places. This is a, a changing room uh, at a laboratory where a staff are required to get into, um, you know, Tyvek suits, booties, um, full coverings, and they have to change out. And because there's only one place for the change room, they're opening this area up, um, having phased. Uh, change outs where people go in at certain times, requiring limits on how many people can be in rooms. So you'll see that, you'll see signage about capacity, how many people can be in a room at any one time, how many people can be in a meeting at any one time. Um, they've On the right side, you've seen, you see they've installed mirrors so you can see if people are in a row or not. <clears throat> a lot of uh, visual requirements to make sure that um, areas are not over, um, over capacity. Uh, a lot of requirements I'm seeing also for shields and masks, uh, putting up signage so that people know that these are still required throughout the workplace. On the right side, um, you can see they've uh, you know, opened up the area. This is just a work area where they are requiring shields and masks. Um, and I think, oh, that is it just for my visuals and general overview of the presentation. Erin. Uh, any questions from you? Awesome. Thank you, Charity, so much for sharing all that information. Um, did have two questions. One was uh, for COVID-19 reopening co-work spaces, because I've been hearing a lot, especially in the startup space, cryptocurrency, blockchain, and this is throughout the world. Everyone in my incubator cohort was telling me, oh yeah, I'm going back to a co-work space. And I saw co-work spaces mm -hmm. sort of shut down. And that's very yeah. different than say like Facebook, Newark is, you know, two miles from my home and Facebook HQ is about 12 minutes. And, you know, all of the buildings there, I just saw 
you know, during COVID-19, everything's like shut down that nobody, we don't have traffic there anymore. <laughs> and I actually was working yeah, at a co right next to Facebook. Mm -hmm. So I was curious to know what that looks like on, um, from your perspective on, on mass, um, on scale from ERM. And then the second one, you know, had to do with more of like timeline again, which I know with, you know, I had a timeline question with uh, the Reverend as well on vaccine development, but given this variant and if there's other variants, does the timeline, like our, our other colleague on our board, um, Jamie Crystal, who's at Airbnb, um, was telling me that for Airbnb, it wasn't summer, but it was fall. You know, I've, I was thinking late fall into 2022 that tech companies reopen. And do you anticipate, I guess, quote unquote, when does normalcy sort of resume if like the larger companies all start to do this around the same timeline and this, the rest of the, the country and the world try to do that shortly after we're we'll looking at a, a January 2023 timeline is what I'm thinking. But uh, I was curious to know your thoughts um, as an expert in this field of how you see that. Yeah, that's a good question. The reopening question is probably uh, one of the biggest questions right now. And it, it really depends. Um, so for example, with the Delta variant, you know, um, and the vaccination uh, percentage for our country, at least in the United States, um, you know, it varies between state to state. Um, and there's a new mandate from uh, President Biden where uh, every company over 100, um, the employees over 100 individuals must require uh, vaccinations in order to come back to work. So that's one of the I guess, strategies to try to get more people vaccinated so that they can come back to work. Even coming back to work, though, and being vaccinated, uh, everyone is still requiring masking, uh, still requiring the social distancing. Um, and I think because they know that the Delta variant is not the only variant, there is a lot of hesitancy about fully reopening because we still don't know what's going on. With all the individuals who are not vaccinated, um, the, the COVID-19 is continuing to mutate. And you know, until we get a, a higher percentage globally of those vaccinated, I think it's gonna be a while before full reopening. A lot of companies are, um, encouraging employees to still work from home unless they're required to come in. Or I've seen phased reopenings where, you know, certain teams only come in on certain days, like Monday, Wednesday, Friday, right? Or maybe just once a week they come in and only that team. So teams are, you know, there's a team on Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday. And, and so rotating the individuals who come in, even though they come back to work, but not having everybody come back at the same time. Yeah, for sure. And then did you have any comments on co-work spaces, which I know is very different from like one company? Yeah. What does that yeah, look like yeah. to you in terms of liability? Yeah. Well, co-work spaces, you know, I, I've seen you're thinking of um, things like a uh, hub space or, you know, things like that, where uh, I've seen that uh, individuals can have offices or their teams can have offices where it can be, you know, one to five people. So there is that protection where you're just in one space. Um, however, the airflow is still continuing, right, to be shared within those workspaces. So it doesn't mean that your air is only staying in your area. The air can still be recirculated back into the system. Um, there are requirements for um, keeping it 100% open supply air, but still, you know, those are things to think about. Um, and there are uh, requirements for a MERV 13 filter. So there's a special filter that um, uh, provides more uh, filtering of microbiologicals like COVID-19, but still there is some circulation. And with co-work spaces, I think, you know, I still think you should still be careful. And unless you really need to be in that co work space to have a team meeting or group meeting to really limit your time. Awesome. Thanks for that. I'm going to ask yeah. Lizelle to come back on video if she's okay. I have like two last questions, and either of you can respond. This one, if it's like hard to, to respond to, it's totally fine. It was just something I was thinking about. So I went to a wedding recently and they required, um, vaccination cards or at least a, a negative COVID test. Uh, and I was talking with my family about this since they had also gone to a wedding and they said that, you know, people can fake, um, your IDs now. So, um, my parents were asking me, like, can we get our digital version? Um, I was curious to know any comments on that as we think about one workplace reopening or even like 
concerts in other places and, and things that you've seen. And I also ask this to Lizelle as a journalist, because, you know, I know Phil Pro is just this, the side, you know, hobby, the way I see faster, but as, as a journalist, you've seen a lot of different coverage on COVID, but I would love to know just your thoughts on that. And, you know, what does that mean in, in terms of our community, you know, keeping our community safe of what we need to do when we hold community spaces, you know, what's important for people to know? Um, I can start. I mean, it's funny because I was actually on assignment this past weekend to check out um, because I work for a travel site. Um, They sent me over to Universal um, Studios Hollywood um, because uh, L.A. County, um, you know, um, their their latest uh, L.A., um, their health order uh, that went into effect on October 7th was required proof, showing proof of vaccination or a negative COVID test to get into like places like a theme park. So I went yesterday to see how that was like, and it was pretty straightforward, but I think what is challenging is like, how do you kind of respond to those things where it can be very easy to like fake a card? Um, I do think that if there's like one centralized system, like I I know that in, at least in California, you can download your QR code for um, your vaccination thing, but it's tough when it's not all consistent you know, and how could you really verify it? I think yesterday went pretty smoothly. I mean, everybody was pretty orderly. There was no major, you know, issues. Um, But again, like, how do we, how do they really know if there wasn't anything to even really scan? So I think that's kind of problematic, Um, but I don't know what the solution is other than like getting everyone on the same system. Um, Because otherwise it just makes it tough for everyone. Because if somebody goes and it's not, and they're not vaccinated and they have to be asymptomatic, that impacts somebody that's there and who knows, you know, with the breakthrough infections, you know, things like that. So I think until we kind of get to that point where everyone's kind of like aligned with that, it's just going to be very difficult. It has been, and you can following a lot of the coverage. It's interesting the way certain like news media outlets cover it. Like you can either the headline, it's the same story, but the headline is either like, for example, the airlines, you know, X number amount of people, have not been vaccinated, they're getting fired versus how about covering it in the other way where this many people got vaccinated, like the percentage versus the negativity. It's still the same story, but told in a different way. So I think as journalists, whoever's covering these type of stories, you got to really think about the framing here. Um, you can tell the same story, but it's the approach that sometimes is just as important as um, kind of getting that message across. Um, If it's always so negative, it's going to be continuing to be negative. I think it's, we should also cover the positive, like, hey, 90% of our workforce got vaccinated. That's not a small feat. That's a lot. And, you know, keeping in mind, there's certain people that can't just for health reasons or whatnot. So I think all that's on the table. Definitely. I did have that code for myself and my parents. And I remember them saying, oh, yeah, I didn't know it was so easy to fake the I didn't even think of that. And that's actually important. Charity, did you have a comment on this? Otherwise, I'll- yeah, I was going to mention there's a black market for COVID-19 vaccination cards. So, yeah, some people would rather pay $100, $200 for a fake card than get a free vaccine. They're just, they're, yeah, there are just some very strong uh, opinions. Uh, about um, the politici- politicization of uh, vac- the vaccination right now process. And, you know, some people are just so against it. You know, it's like my body, my choice. Um, and I think, you know, they're not really thinking about how this affects the rest of the world. And, um, you know, it is, a, as you mentioned, there is, a, you know, there are programs right now where you can upload your COVID-19 uh, vaccine um, card and then it will record it and then you can use that. But, you know, still, how do you confirm that it's accurate and that it's real and that that's, there's no one program right now. Every state has a different program and they don't require that. If you have a card, some places are just taking the card. Others will take your, a photo of your card and Some don't even check your ID against the photo of your vaccination card. So I've been to several restaurants already and it's, it varies a lot. I feel you on all of those same points. I always try to make sure I have my card when it's required and you know, the, the actual QR code, but I realize like that is actually really easy to fake. 
Um, so it's important for us as a community, you know, I think with FASTER, one of the reasons why I wanted to make sure last year and this year, we have folks that are scientists in the field, one, to, to validate the research that's that's been done. Uh, we do recognize it's been like a very quick turnaround. Like I said, FDA approvals usually take 10 years. So there's definitely a lot of stigma in our community, but also to, to trust, you know, like it, this is science, right, as a value in us as an organization that is committed to justice, diversity, equity, inclusion, having Filipino American scientists, engineers, safety experts be a part of this, um, really just making sure that our community knows of the facts, you know, that's, that's super important. Um, my last question uh, for you two is what does it mean to be Filipino American within your field as, you know, a penai? you know, high ranking, as I mentioned, with with charity, I know you said there's two partners, um, yourself and one other in Seattle, like, what does that mean to you? And then Lizelle, I know that I, I remember asking you, I was like, oh, is the points guy, like your, your new firm, I thought it was venture capital firm uh, at first, like, what does that mean to you? And, you know, how do we want to increase representation of Filipino Americans um, within our fields? Because uh, I, I see a lot of people, you know, dropping out, especially women in the workforce, um, in our community, even within tech, you know, whether it's caregiving, stay at home moms, et cetera, uh, just brief comments about that, because I think it's really important for, for us to one, show showcase women that are still trying to do it, but it, it becomes challenging, right? How do you kind of sort of think of doing it all? Um, so I'll popcorn this to Charity first. Yeah, I think for me, it's been, um you know, one of my purpose areas is just to increase the number of uh, women and penais who are in tech fields and, and also who are in management and, and moving up to C-suite levels. And now I'm also starting to look at board levels as well, because I think we really need to increase that representation. It's easy to um, pull back. There are so many, you know, as, as many of us are part of our own, you know, families, our communities, we have strong family ties. And I think especially with Filipino families, there's a lot of pressure for women to kind of do it all, you know, take care of the kids, take care of the household, take care of their parents, um, take care of problems that happen. And, you know, I think we're very capable, but um, we get pulled back into the family setting and, you um, that usually becomes our priority over our career. And I think we have to remember that, you know, we need to keep paving the way and staying if we can. Um, and we were, you know, to have our families and our community help us to do that. So I know for me and, and my husband, I actually let them know about 10 years ago, you know, I had four kids and I was like, you know, I really want to do more in my career, but I can't because I have so many family responsibilities. And so we switched roles. He became more of the family caretaker so that I could spend more time focusing on community um, and also on my career. So I think you have to have those conversations with your family and let them help you. Let them, you know, help where they can so that you can continue to pivot and move forward in those areas if you have a passion to in your industry um, and pave the way. And the other part is mentorship, mentoring those behind you or mentoring the younger professionals so that they continue, can continue to follow um, or you can continue to guide them on how to deal with the politics of being in, you know, especially in tech. There are, is a lot of politics and I know as Filipinos, we don't really like to get involved, but we have to, we have to in order to stay in the game. Definitely, and Lizelle? Yeah, I would definitely 100% agree with all that. I think it's important that we continue to amplify each other. I think it could be very easy to fall in the trap of like, oh, they're my competition. I'm the only one. Oh, there's another Filipino in the room. Oh my God, like I have to outdo that person. And when in reality, that's just detrimental to everyone. They're not your competition <laughs> in many ways. You're all, you are your own competition. Um, it is only to your benefit to help those uh, like ahead of you, behind you, at your same level and really normalize that. It's not enough that we're getting people in the door. How do we keep them there? I think that's where, I, I think the conversation kind of trails off. Like, I wish that, you know, there were more people, like I'm discovering more people now, like, yay. Um, but, you know, working in a industry that puts me in primarily a lot of white spaces, I didn't, I rarely ever ran into another Filipina or Filipino rarely um it's only now that i think i've been seeing more so it's like how do we kind of you know teach that pass that on to the folks right behind us 
to arm them with the strategies to how do you navigate this? I mean, I'm still learning myself. Like, how do I navigate these spaces that may not be comfortable, that are full of people that do not look like me, that don't know, that do not come from the shared experience. And I mean, and I think it's really doubling down and not being afraid to be Filipino. Whereas I think generation before, even early in my career, like that was very tempered because it's like, why do you want to stand out? Like, you know, you don't want to be seen as only the person covering Filipino or Asian issues. Now it's like, why not? Like, if you don't, who else is going to? And that should be part of the, that should have been always part of the conversation and really kind of just, you know, encouraging um, that mindset and not being afraid because, you know, we've got your back. Um, I think it was much harder for me starting out when I didn't see very many people. Uh, now it's like, Whenever I see another Filipino byline, I always add them to my ongoing Twitter list because it's like, okay, just to remind myself, we are not alone. There are people, there are a lot of Kaba Bayans out there and um, just have to continue to uplift, uplift each other um, as much as we can. I kept Lizelle on my Twitter list for like forever until we reconnected. And actually one of the other people from AAJA, Jaws from Wang, um, is also visiting. She met our marketing director, Ian. And it's funny, like so many years later, we still see people, you know, organizing in the community together. And, you know, that always warms my heart. Um, any last thoughts of advice? I know I had that little advice quote on this slide. If you had a couple of words of wisdom or mottos that you live by you want to give to, you know, aspiring folks that are working in the fields of, of STEAM or, or just anywhere in your career in general? Any last words? I'll go. Um, if it's scary, it's probably a good indication you should do it because that's the only way you can grow. So I have been definitely living by that in the last year or so, and it's served me pretty well. So I'm going to keep going with that. So. Um, I would say um, take up space and um, don't play small because I, I did that for a long time because I thought, well, there's no one else who looks like me or, you know, I'm afraid or I don't know who to turn to or, you know, maybe I have imposter syndrome and I, I'm not sure if I should be here. But, you know, anytime you have those questions, you need to just reiterate that you know you're here for a reason you have a purpose um, and you should play big because that's how everyone else does it and you're not helping anyone if you play small um, you know you really need to take up your own space um, use your voice be vocal and and do the things you really want to do because you don't want to have regrets in the end I know we're almost at time. Uh, I have one last, last one. And I, I see Professor Manila still here. We're going to be actually promoting more of this on YouTube and post. Uh, we have shared this to our Facebook group and Facebook Live. But last question is, how do you self-care um, while you're doing community organizing? I, I see both of you where I'm like, oh, I forget how many boards that you <laughs> advise both of you. Um, Charity, it's, it's always an honor to have you in the room. And then Lizelle, just seeing you grow you know, over the years, um, how do you self-care as a community organizer, um, as a Filipina in the community while balancing work? Nizelle, you want to go first? Okay, I'll go. Um, it's still a work in progress, I will admit. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's so easy to become the, the workaholic that I think a lot of us are when we do this type of work, but um, I'm glad you brought it up because it is important to take that time for yourself. Um, I'll say my guilty pleasure is I binge watch a lot of stuff on TV. So I've gone through so many series, like you probably name one, I probably have seen the entire thing. Um, and you know, now that I work at a travel site, I'm gonna, I'm trying to be very intentional in actually taking a trip without having it be part of anything. So that is my goal um, in the next couple of months. We'll see where, you know, the Delta variant and all these other things coming up. Um, but that is my goal to, to actually really take a trip. I haven't taken a true trip that has nothing to do with anything that I'm part of um, in the last couple of years. So I'm long overdue for that. Awesome. Vacation's important. Charity. Yeah, that's so good, Lizelle. I have to reach out to you about the point sky. <laughs> to figure out how that works and how I can save money while I'm also doing self-care. Um, for me, it's really um, 
reaching out to my community and letting them know when I need help. You know, my friends, my family, my my husband just passed away a few year, a uh, few weeks ago, and I'm gonna admit it's gonna be hard. I know it's gonna be really hard. Um, and what's been keeping me afloat is the community. You know, they they know that I'm gonna need the support, and they've reached out. And I think you know, saying, "Hey, I need help," or "Hey, these are my limits." You know, I've had to reach out to the other boards I'm on and say, "You know, I'm gonna need a couple months, right?" Or "I'm gonna need some time. I'll let you know when I'm ready to come back." I think you just have to be really honest and vocal. It's easy to say, "You know, I can," and I've done this before. I've said, "You know, I can do it. I'm gonna work through it," but it will still come back that you're gonna be burnt out. You're gonna feel like. Um, you know, you uh, can't give because you don't have any more to give. So you don't want to get to that point. You want to um, make sure that you still feel healthy, that you're vocal, and you're leading and, you know, you're uh, providing an example to others, um, especially for me, my mentees. I have to remember that and say, and, and also my staff. So I used to be the kind of person I would send emails at like 2 a.m. in the morning because I'd be like catching up on work, right? But the example I'm providing to my staff is, you know, you should overwork yourself. And so I started limiting my communication with my staff and my teams to, okay, I'm going to do it only like nine to seven. I have a time limit. You don't have to answer. If I reach out to you, reach out when you're ready, you know, but giving people, other people that space to self-care as well. Definitely. And um, prayers to you and your family and, and to Eric, um, you know, our hearts are, broken when we heard the news and so we've definitely sent out the news to the faster community there's the gofundme campaign and i know that you have the the meal train as well um for eric and your family um we're praying for you and in terms of i guess both of your responses um it's always been important for me to try to self-care i always find that it's the hardest thing um but it is really important that we talk about it and you know mental health during covid i know it, we didn't have as much time you know this um day for faster just because we had so many events um to talk about it but we'll try to make more space to talk about that just because i think as community leaders as organizers or as anyone you know even if you're just surviving covid it can be really tough as a, like a woman of color um you know to do that and uh, i think bound Boundaries are really important, you know, as you're balancing work, um, family, and community um, to make sure to do that. But anyways, this is, I think, the end of our time. Thank you so much for both of you and your presentations today. Everything from PhilPro, COVID-19 Task Force, and TAYO, and everything on health, tech, and safety. Uh, thank you, Charity and Lizelle. Um, you can find us for Faster at fasterstein-steam.org. Uh, all of the different social media handles are at fasterstein. Thank you all today, and happy Filipino X American History Month. Uh, have a good rest of your day. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye.